Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And today we're going to talk about a book that, in a sense, I'm, I'm surprised has been written. It has been written very well. The title of the book is The Darling. It's a novel by Christina Alger. Very well said. And it is a Pamela Dorman book published by Viking. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for having me. The uh, Pamela Dorman book. Pamela is an editor and has an imprint. Is that? Yeah, she's an editor at Viking Press and she has her own imprint. And that makes that makes her your best friend. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would think so. The, uh, the the book is the first or one of the first novels about the disastrous financial year of 2008. And uh, you seem well qualified to write <laughs> in terms of your in terms of your background. Uh, you uh, graduated Harvard and uh, New York University Law School. And you've worked as an analyst at Goldman Sachs and Company. What, what, what does an analyst do <laughs> at a place like Goldman Sachs? Well, it was my first job out of college, so um, I did a lot of menial labor. I think a lot of <laughs> spreadsheets, um, a bit of filing, exactly a bit, a bit of filing, answering a phone. So I did that in between college and law school. Uh huh. But it's 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 not a, and and now you're. A, or well, you were. I don't know whether you're now an attorney. You know, I'm. Well, I'm writing full time, so I, I may still be an attorney, according to the New York Bar Association. But <laughs> I haven't checked in a little while. <laughs> well, also maybe sales will make you an attorney. Again. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. Shouldn't say that. But you have given up that area of of work to be a full time writer. I have, yeah. And what made you decide to? Uh, to write about the disaster of 2008? Well, I was working as a lawyer during the fall of 2008 as a bankruptcy attorney, and it just seemed like a really interesting time to be living in in New York. It was it was a very traumatic time to be living in New York and working on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of phenomenal nonfiction being written in fairly short order about that period, and but I didn't see any fiction um, being written and. I thought I would. Um, it was sort of an interesting time to to think about and write about. So I started writing it just as a just purely for fun while I was working. And Good. It snowballed into something larger. So. And all of a sudden, somebody wanted to publish it. Yeah, I'm very lucky. <laughs> Congratulations! Congratulations! One of the most interesting things about this book, in my opinion, is the way it starts. It starts. Not many novels start with an introduction. But yours does, and I'd like you to read a little bit of it, please. Sure. He hated miscalculations. There had been a lot recently, which was, of course, how he had ended up parked at the base of the Tappan Zee Bridge at 2 a.m. on a Wednesday. Not exactly plan A. His mind whirred as he parked the car and switched off the headlights. The engine fell silent, and all he could hear was the white noise of cars crossing the bridge and the rush of his own blood roaring in his ears. He sat still for a minute, staring blindly at the bridge. It looked different than it had last week. In the daylight, it looked like a steel cage suspended over the river, more like a carnival ride, a roller coaster with two peaks. The top beams were lit up, and the reflection danced across the black water below. It was beautiful. This was harder than he had thought it would be, maybe impossibly hard. He knew he had to stop thinking and just move, but his heart was pumping so hard that he felt faint, almost as if he was having an epileptic seizure. He reached for the bottle of Dilantin that he kept in the glove compartment. He had bottles stashed in every car, just in case. His hands shook as he twisted off the cap, and the bottle slipped out of his hands. He scooped up the pills from the passenger seat, there were only two left, and he put them in his pocket. You know this bridge, he told himself. It's three miles long and seven lanes wide and there are four phones, two on each side. The storm was turning up the river. He couldn't see it in the dark, but he imagined it now, the cold, tufted rush of black water slipping endlessly beneath the belly of the bridge. Already there were sustained winds of up to 40 miles an hour, with gusts of up to 60 miles an hour, so the current was moving faster than normal. If someone were to jump, his body would be pulled down, under, into the river, swallowed whole. They might not even find the body, just a heart-deadening splash, and gone. In the past ten years, there have been more than 25 suicides from this bridge. 
They put in the phones to connect callers to a suicide prevention hotline. The weather is optimal. This has to be done now. Running through statistics and scenarios, especially the outside or unlikely ones, the ones that others might discount to zero, usually calmed him. His breath slowed a little, enough so that he could get out of the car. His shoe hit a patch of loose dirt, causing him to slip slightly. He stopped and wiped a bead of sweat from his temple. He couldn't see the phones in the darkness, but he knew it was there, just yards away. For the millionth time, he reminded himself this wasn't just the best exit strategy— It was the only exit strategy. He had done the math, run the numbers, analyzed the risk. This was it, the only way out. What a way to begin a novel. What a way. It's a (laughs) dramatic, dramatic beginning. (laughs) Did you always begin it that way? It was just after several revisions. Uh, No, you know, the book takes place over a very short timetable. Yes, it does. A little less than a week, a little more than a week. Five days about. Five days, yeah. Um, and I had sort of, I liked the idea of staying within that time frame. Um, I, it was sort of fun to watch things devolve very quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, but then I, um, after back and forth with the editor, we attached this introduction and an epilogue, which take place outside the five day time frame to give a little bit of context to the story. And the chapters are not numbered. They are labeled a day of the week and time of that particular day. Yeah, it all happened so quickly. I thought it was sort of best to keep things time stamped. So you kind of, um, especially since there are a few different storylines that are taking place over that time period. Quite a few. <laughs> so hopefully it helps sort of orient you to have a time stamp. And that, and that introduction, you know, is, is a real turn on. I, I think it's, it's great for anybody browsing if they read that. I think they're very likely to read the book or buy it. Well, that's great to hear. Yeah. Well, there are many things that we can talk about in this book, but I, I want to get to uh, understanding a little bit the main family and the characters in it called The Darlings. We'll take care of that when we come back. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. The Darlings, that's the book we're talking about. It's a novel by Christina Alger, published by Viking. And it's a Pamela Dorman book. And a pretty well known fair country writer by the name of Jay McInerney, he's had some successes says in part that uh, Christine Alger is so good, you just know she's an inside trader. And intimately, f- and, or as intimately familiar with the inner workings of Wall Street investment banks as she is with Haute Manhattan social life. She's also a gifted storyteller. The Darlings is an utterly compelling novel, is as knowing about family as it is about money and social status and may be the best literary product of the financial crisis to date. So says Mr. McInerney. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And, you know, it is about family in a number of different ways. Uh, First of all, it's about a family company, and that's something that— I never knew existed on Wall Street. That's still happening? I I mean, when I think of Wall Street, I think of huge conglomerates, you know, occupying lots of floors and fancy buildings. You see what happens when you're out here on the West Coast. (laughs) You get a strange uh, idea of it. Well, I grew up around a family business, and it was a Wall Street family business. So um, it was a very formative experience for me, and so Mm -hmm. it helped me sort of craft the characters of the two daughters. Are there still family businesses out there? I believe so. Um, there, you know, ours is still around, so <laughs> I imagine there are a few other ones too. Yeah. More, more importantly, uh, this is a book where family life plays a terribly important part, and uh, you you can't, or well, I can't think about family life in this book without thinking about Inez. Who's Inez? 
Inez is Carter Darling, who's the patriarch of the family, um, is married to Inez Darling, and their two daughters are Lily and Merrill Darling, and both Lily and Merrill's husbands work for Carter, so it's a family business in a true sense. We there's a there's a chapter or a part of the book where Inez is really central, in that she's running a fundraising mm-hmm. business in 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 the midst of the down period when a lot of people are not working, a lot of companies have folded and are about to fold, but she runs a very successful event. She does. I, I lo- Inez is a tough, tough cookie. So she's, um, you know, they've, they're have they self-made as a couple, and she's, she's very type A. She's very aggressive. And the opening scene shows her kind of running this charity gala where she's the chairperson, and she's sort of determined to make it the best gala no matter what the economic situation is. So she's uh, tenacious. And and she seems to do a pretty good job of it. She does. She's, you know, she's she's very good at what she does. She's she, They're a true power couple. <laughs> I don't think of her. Yeah, I guess she is power, isn't she? She's, uh, well, I think, you know, in a sort of social sense, she's, um, she's a force to be reckoned with. What about, uh, what about Carter? What do you think of him? Well, Carter is, um, you know, he's, I think, in some ways very flawed and in some ways very sympathetic. So he's, um, he he runs a very large, successful business. He's very deeply committed to his two daughters, um, which he demonstrates through employing their husbands and sort of providing this life for them. But I think, you know, ultimately his um, his ambition clouds his judgment. That's a nice way of saying it. Um what what's really involved here let's get down to the nitty gritty of the of of the plot is a ponzi scheme involving as it must many players and several companies and people from the SEC uh are trying to expose it and shut it down this is a nasty business It is. And, you know, one of the things I tried to do in the book was at the time when I was watching these things kind of unfold in the press is um, it really isn't just one person who's, you know, creating these problems. It's really a a web of, you know, accountants and lawyers and sort of failures on the government officials parts. And so um, I tried to kind of create that web of deceit and deception in the book. The interesting thing about the web is that Everybody in the web, it seems to me, at least in your book, is willing to sell out everybody else <laughs> if if, it's a if nasty they can bunch. get yeah if, if they can get through this unscathed. Well, I think the one person who struggles with it perhaps the most is Paul, who's the protagonist of the book, and he's perhaps the most kind of um, ethical or moral of all the characters, and he struggles the most with the idea of selling someone down the river to save himself. I think you're right. Everybody else does it with. Great uh, speed. Remarkable ease, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's, woo, there he goes, sorry. We can't be caught here. Let's put it on this guy's shoulders or this woman's shoulders. Well, they all have a lot at stake, so, you know, they're making these decisions. And, and one of the reasons I liked having it sort of take place over this compressed timetable is, you know, they have to make these decisions very, very quickly with a lot at stake, so it keeps yeah. things exciting. Yeah, which which – Allows for the possibility that maybe they're not making good decisions exactly. because they're because they're so rushed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, the other the other part of it is that uh, it, it takes so many players to to it does to, to make this this happen. I'm I, I, I'm thinking of the two guys in a in an office in a in a, in a strip mall on Long Island <laughs> who are you know having a good time. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I kept thinking during that period was, you know, how could this happen? And it really does take sort of a, a number of people operating in different ways, I think, to create a financial sort of scandal of that magnitude. So it was fun to kind of create that in a fictional setting. <laughs> and all throughout the novel, from page one, although I wasn't aware of it, the good guys, the S- the SEC and so forth, are at work. Yes. Trying trying to stop this kind of thing. Yes, very much so. Well, we'll look at some more of the twists and turns of the darlings 
when we come back. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Christina Alter really writes the book. And the book that she's written is a novel called The Darlings. And it's uh, all about Wall Street investment bankers and all those folks and what they did in the difficult times of 2008. And among the things that went on at that time, as you will recall, was things called Ponzi schemes. And this is a book about a Ponzi scheme. And it, it becomes very in, involved. It's an intricate plot, beautifully handled. And Tom Rackman who wrote a best-selling book called The Imperfectionists, says, For those who have only gazed up at the palatial residences of Manhattan, this is a glimpse from the penthouse down. In her engaging and assured debut, Christina Alger weaves a complex thriller from this world as a Wall Street scandal threatens to devastate a family far more accustomed to charity galas or galas than to chats with the feds. (laughs) I like that. I do too. (laughs) Chats with the feds. And what do they wind up chatting with the feds about? Well, Carter Darling, who he, um, he runs a fund of funds, which is heavily invested uh, with Morty Reese, um, who, um, in the opening sort of introduction, which I read earlier, um, throws himself off the Tappan Zee Bridge shortly before Thanksgiving weekend. And it sort of comes to light that his his fund is a Ponzi scheme and he's being investigated for that. Um, Carter Darling has been unfortunately investing with him for a number of years and so is in trouble himself for this. Yeah, covering up is what he's been doing. Yeah, or looking if, blind if, eye. <laughs> even if unknowing. And the... The, the, one of the things in the plot that really made me angry was the way Paul was handled. Now, Paul is an outsider to the wealth. I mean, he, for a long time, like one of the things he talks about is that he never had a good or a real family life. And one of the things that attracted him to the Darlings and one of the things that made him take a job with the Darlings company after his own law firm exploded was the sense that he would then go into that family structure and that would make him very happy. So when they turned on him, so to speak, I was very angry. I was too. <laughs> <laughs> Paul is, um, you know, he comes he comes from a family where he he's not very well connected with his own family and so he marries into this very tightly knit, very loyal bunch, the darlings and um, I think he feels sort of taken in by them. And so when he's put in a position where they're kind of turning on him, it's very traumatic and sort of devastating for the reader, I think, to watch it. Sure as heck got me, <laughs> I'll tell you. Now, one of the uh, main characters in the book that I really like is not a darling. He's the, the been the lawyer to the darlings for mm-hmm. a long, long time. And his name is Saul Penzel. And Saul really loves Manhattan, (laughs) Uh, even though he has a a little house, or a big one, I don't know which, uh, in the Hamptons. And uh, I'd like you to read that part of the book where Saul is driving back from the Hamptons to beloved Manhattan, I guess on the Long Island Expressway. We're coming back into the city now, Saul said. He adjusted the rearview mirror and stepped on the gas the monotony of the suburban Long Island rolling out beneath his car tires. He hated this part of the island, not yet city, but no longer country. All car dealerships and office complexes and people putting gas in their Honda Civics, the kind of people who either couldn't afford to live in Manhattan or chose not to. Seoul couldn't decide which was worse. All the houses looked the same, stacked ten deep around cul-de-sacs. It brought back bad memories. As he passed a furniture warehouse with a fluorescent green sail banner fluttering from its windows, Saul thought, I can't believe I grew up here. His sister and Marion's two brothers still lived within ten miles of the next exit, 
but Sol had successfully avoided visiting any of them for more than three years. Instead, the family came to them for birthdays and seders and the occasional casual visit. Sol has to work, Marion would say, but we'd love to have you over the apartment. Sol suspected that Marion's brothers took quiet offense at this pattern, but he didn't really care. If they thought he was being selfish, they were right. If they thought he had a superiority complex, they were also right. The reality was that he and Marion had a cook and a staff and set the table with cloth napkins instead of paper, and at the end of the night, no one had to take out the dogs or the trash. To pretend that Passover with the Schwartzmans and Great Neck would be equally nice required theatrical capabilities that Sol did not possess. Also, he usually did have to work. He wouldn't say that his time was too valuable to be spent in transit, but it was too valuable to be spent in transit to his in-law's house. <laughs> There's there's a line in in that reading that is so Manhattan <laughs> that I have to repeat it. If they thought he was being selfish, they were right. If they thought he had a superiority complex, they were also right. <laughs> <laughs> and yet you like Saul as I do. I do. I have deep affection for him. He's um. You know, he's very tough, but he's also very devoted to his wife, which makes me kind of have a soft spot for him. It's it's difficult, and, and I don't want to really share how this novel ends. It, in a sense, it, it ends on a wonderfully ironic note. And uh, I guess the bad guys pretty much get caught. Pretty much. Not entirely, but... Um... It's, Just a few of them get away. <laughs> well, I can't. I can't say that. But I think there's. Um, it's. It's left a little bit open ended, which I think is part of the fun of writing a book that takes place over five days. Is that you can't really wrap everything up. So it's. It's, it's also part of the truth. I think mm -hmm. of these kinds of crimes at the high end. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I think some of these things are still being wrapped up now. You know, it's pretty recent. So. Um, so it was hard for me to kind of wrap everything with a neat bow at the end. Well, you can get wrapped up in a great book. It's called The Darlings, a novel by Christina Alger. And this has been Conversations on the Coast. I'm Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster, coc at gmail.com.